okay. okay. Let's start the recording. I know. I'm sorry. Okay, so where are we? Let's take stock. So we're past the midterm point by somebody's reckoning, not mine. Um, and you all had your midterm grades turned in for you. We also are now past what I call the lift. In other words, the reading and the sort of trying to get in our head, all this stuff that Steve has shoved at you. Uh, the last time we were sitting around yakking, we were talking about TPAC. We weren't talking about SAMR because it's off the table now. And UDL. It's now Tim. That's what they like to talk about. And your last assignment was to create something in this thing called blend space where I was asking you to go in there and take a look at the videos. What do you think about the videos I had in there? Did anybody look at the one with the guy? I said I was going to grow up and become the principal of school. He had the tie on and he had all the crap in his room, all the computers and all the tablets. Well, let me go visit him. You all can see what I'm talking about. So this was, you went here and you looked at a whole bunch of the videos that we had. And you were supposed to find a video that you thought demonstrated TPAC, one that demonstrated Tim, and then one that demonstrated universal design for learning. And there's some in here that are really quite good. And then there's some in here who are, that are just absolutely hilarious, that they're so bad. Um, this is the guy, iPads in the classroom. They're trying to set an example about the benefits of using new technology in the classroom. His students use iPads. All right. First of all, count how many times somebody says, well, I certainly didn't know what to do with those things, or we didn't have those when I was in school. Count how many times you hear that. So you still hear that today. iPods and laptops for educational purposes on a daily basis. That Dear Lisa got to see the students in action today and joins us from our Finger Lakes Bureau in Canada. Which had well, Rich, I can tell you the six and seven year olds probably know how to use an iPad better better than I do. There you go. There's one. Uh, you know, their teacher says that he's seen a big difference in how his uh, students learn with this technology and he's hoping to share his success stories with other teachers from all across the country. So he can move up the administrative ladder. You, you don't mind me adding this little subtext in, do you? Here he is. One group is going to use the iPad Touch. The other group is going to be in the iPad. Welcome to first grade, 2011 style. This is Richard Glossy's first grade classroom at Canandaigua Primary School. Notice how he's reading the book to the kids. I'm sorry. From a distance, it looks like how many of us remember first grade. But take a step closer and you'll see that's not a book on tape. It's a book on an iPod. And that's not a paperback green eggs and ham. It's on an iPad and it's interactive. Do you like to read paper books or the book on the iPad? The book on the iPad. Probably do it on the iPad. Is it something that the kids really enjoy and they're able to have a deeper understanding of some of the content? Okay. As I told you, it's now what, six years, seven years ago? When they made this, he's a principal somewhere. Okay, the whole point of that one was to make you look at it and go, wait a minute, all you're talking about is the technology. Where's the pedagogy? Where's the content? You know, it's all about kids love doing this better than they do with a book in their hand. I would argue that point. I would argue that point. I would argue that point. The book in the hand is still the best way to interface with reading. I'm sorry. Maybe that's me being old fashioned. Um, what did you think? Did anybody pick on this one? We showed this one in the room, didn't we? The guy with the, yeah, the graphs. We talked about him in class. Where's the one? She's using Skype uh, to do English as a second, in an English second language class. I guess maybe I, either I lost it or I didn't include it because it was so obviously bad. 
we kind of looked at this guy, the teaching maths with iPads. I put a lot of K-tip in here because I wanted to have stuff that was, you know, real, honest to gosh stuff. You're going to need to be able to see the screen. So I hope you picked a spot where you can see the smart board. Yeah. I'll, I'll just take it. Okay. I keep forgetting who you all are. So forgive me if I say stuff and you already know it. You're just like, yeah, Stephen, don't tell me about that. K-tip cycle three. What does that mean to you? Anything? Okay. So K-tip was the old system, whereas when you got a job, you spent the first year in as a apprenticeship. And you had a committee of three, a principal, usually a teacher from the building, and me, teacher educator who shows up. Um, you got me if you're an elementary teacher and you were a uh, special ed. You got me. Otherwise, you got somebody from around here who does, you know, I don't know if uh, Dr. Brown did pay tip or not. Point is, cycle three. You had three visits. Cycle like one was I show up and I go, where's your lesson plan? And I sit with a document and I basically go through and score what you do. So it's principal, so is the other teacher. And we all meet and we go, yeah, things are looking good. Things are great. Or we all get together and go, holy moly, what happened here? Now, the point of K-TIP was not to fuck you. The point was to find the help for you if you needed. So by the time K-TIP 2 rolls around, then things have changed for the better. By the time K-TIP 3 rolls around, which is what this video was, I'm just getting ready to watch, that is always that was always done through a video. In other words, the teacher would just have somebody come in, usually the librarian, um, as the years went on, because K-TIP's hey, been around for a long time, guys. Um, we got to phones, etc. And what people would do is just basically they film themselves. Now, the beauty of it is you have this enormous library now of people teaching. And it's a wonderful way to show, do this, don't do that. Uh, so that's why I put a bunch of them in here, because I found the ones. I don't know any of these. I, that's a lie. I do know some of them. The guy down here at the bottom on the left, I think, who's actually teaching a technology class, he was one of mine. Um, so that's the setup. So let me go back and let it run. Let's see how she does. Heard her say something about smart board. In science, what have we been talking about? Somebody remind me. Liquid, force, and motion. Yes. Thank you. What are the four? All right, let's stop her right there. So right out of the box, she makes it pretty clear what content they're going to be doing. Agree? Mm -hmm. So what have you been talking about? Force and motion. Okay. What would this be, you think? Fourth grade? Maybe third. Different types. Maybe younger than of, that. Of force that we have been talking about. Fire, remind me of what? Human force. And what is human force? Um, what, is, what can humans do? Push and pull. Push and pull. Certain object, yes. What is another type of horse that we have been talking about? Favorite? Now, the first thing, the first thing I would have dinked her on was what? Her papers. You know that? She's reading from her paper. She's got good contact kids. Uh, kids are doing, you know, they're tuned in to her. She's a little up here on them. You know what I mean? You know, she's like doing that to him when she's talking to him. Little kids, little kids don't like that. They pick up on that. And she's nervous. And she's nervous because she's in front of a stupid camera. I mean, I don't understand yeah, why you. people freak out, but let's get started. Okay. So obviously she's using her smart board, her technology. Let me run it back a little bit. So let's see what she does with this. Is balanced. Kid coming in. It's out of the way. Good job. I am so good. This was 
Okay, let's just click through here. We are we're in the pool. That's about the flag in the middle. When was when were the forces equal? When were the forces equal? I noticed the forces were also equal when Tom and Bean were doing it. A little bit. Cameron, when did you notice that the flag in the middle of the forces were equal? Um, when they weren't moving. When they weren't moving, they were. By the way, as an, as an aside, as an aside, where is this video hosted? How are we watching this video? Where is it? YouTube. So she's put her video of her lesson, her K-3 lesson, on YouTube. You see her face and his face and his face and his face, their face. I said, no, no. It says it right there on YouTube. Do not put kids' faces on YouTube. And what's interesting is there's a very, there's, it's a very simple tool. You can go in and literally, it's like a, you just click on it, and you can go through and just scribble over their faces. It scrubs them out so you don't see their faces. So if you ever do something, where you're going to create something that's in your classroom and you want to put it out on YouTube. You you go into where you upload it, and there's a little set over here called Tools, and you click on it, and one of them says, scrub it. Just go in and go, scrub everybody's face out. That's a big no-no, but no, their faces come through. Even if kids have uh, video and photographic release forms, because every school, every kid should have one of those. All right, I'm getting off topic. But that's that caught my eye as well. Now, so we've watched the technology was yeah, her and the. You might want to be the bigger person. And oh. Say, All right. You can have it this time. I'll get it next time. Or what can you do that kind of helps you choose who goes first in an equal way? For sure. This is how you see technology used most of the time. This is a really good example. Is it bad? Is it good? Is it? Eh? What do you think? Yeah, I mean, I'm kind of like, yeah, okay. I mean, what happened to having to, you know, we watched the video, could we do something similar in the room that would be safe? Like we sat and did a, you know, tug of war. That'd be fairly safe. Now, standing up and doing a tug of war, you could get somebody pulled over into the chairs or whatever. But, you know, I didn't really see anything here that I would look at it and go, it's not a bad example of TPAC. It's a pretty standard example of TPAC, actually. Then let's see. Look at this one. This one's kind of crazy. What we can do is we can run a simulation. So if you click on the heat bar, so what do you think is happening here? What does this show you? The glass gets higher. The glass would be like what? The object you did. The beaker, sure, like the beaker, and the oak would be like the wood. The wood. Okay. What do you want to try now? Mm -hmm. Oak and steel. Oak and steel, okay. Okay, so once again, contents front and center. Uh, pedagogy is, teacher is doing what's called CAM, by the way, which means nothing more than he's modeling. You know, he's sitting there with the kids. He's going, well, let's look at the glass. Let's look at the oak. You know, that's basically it's what you're looking for. And then we finally see the uh, other pedagogy that he's employing here is the inquiry-based learning, where he's turning the kids loose to do it. You can tell that these are, look at this, these are old Macintoshes. See the apple right there? There's still a disk drive slot in it. So this is fairly old stuff, but still it holds up. The steel is a lot more dense than the oak. Why do you think that? The oak is absorbent and the oak is absorbing a lot less than the steel is. Yeah. Yeah. Right. That's a really good T pack. Contents front and center. Pedagogical slides going all over the place, and the technology is enabling that. Now you could take that technology away, and you could hand out pieces of paper to kids that had those same kind of graphs on them. 
where they're showing the density here and how fast the uh, heat is rising, moving through these different substances, you could just do that with paper. But the fact is you can actually see it, and even better would be, and I don't think that was the case there, I could be wrong, even better would be the fact that they would be sitting there with the actual things in their hands and applying the heat to them. Let's see if I can find the hilarious one. We looked at maths in classroom. Okay, let me let you see this one. All right. Oh, here we go. All right. Go ahead and see. Count how many times he says all right. All right. Good morning, everybody. Today's lesson. All right, let's start out with a bell ringer. We're going to have, uh, have you tell me about one of your friends or yourself uh, who's posted uh, something online that maybe they shouldn't have. Digital literacy class. So it could be a Classic tweet. Class. It could be something they posted on Facebook. Classic class taught in high school. Uh, you may have taken it when you were in high school. And this guy barely got out of Kato. He was one of mine. He barely got out of Kato. Mainly because everything in his room was very technocentric. You know, he would argue back at me, he goes, well, I'm a technology teacher. But not in digital literacy. Now, if he was a, you know, he was teaching Microsoft Office, if he was teaching database design, stuff like that, sure. But you're not. You're teaching digital literacy. You're trying to up the level of understanding the kids have about how technology is used. And the fact that all you were doing is you were having them, he was using uh, a very early tool like a classroom called Edmodo. And he was having kids go in and upload their stuff into that. So we asked you to find three examples, one for each of the things. Now, what was Tim? Remember Tim? Technology integration matrix. TPAC looks at a teacher. I walk in a room. I'm not really looking at what kids are necessarily doing. I'm looking at what the teacher is doing with the technology. I'm looking for those pedagogical slides that Shulman talks about, and I'm looking to make sure the technology is not front and center, the star of the show, it's the supporting uh, cast. Tim is, what do I see kids doing? So a good example of the Tim. And you can't see it, unfortunately. Well, yeah, you kind of can see it. If you go up and you use, oh, where is he? Mr. Mass in the classroom. Here he is. Teaching mass with iPads. Sorry about that. Somebody got really creative with their video. Everything is pointed at him. So it's kind of hard to know what he's doing. But you can glean from what he's talking and he's doing that he's all about the iPad used by the kids who are sitting out there in front of him. This is a good video because somebody didn't film kids. They filmed him up front talking about it. So that's a good Tim one. Um, here's another good one. Let's see if we can get this one bigger. Think about everything that you saw. Multiple things. And then you guys know about that environment. And you can come up with lots of each of these. Think about the one thing that's going to make these ecosystems work. 
So he used his clear touch up here. Things called clear touch, by the way. These are what you're seeing in schools more and more instead of smart boards. A smart board, um, half the size of this screen, is a six thousand dollar investment. Okay. That device right there, which is called a clear touch, is about a quarter of that cost. So, and the Down here is a set of icons, just like on your computer, that you can tap on and different things happen. He's using his, is that an iPad? Okay, so like I said, I'm gonna use my Raider app, and if I call you, you can come up and you can give the right end. This is also a good example of you, yeah, why? You start to get along over here, my eyes, I'll ask you to run the name Classic example of how UDL is at work. So here we, we've got all of this technology that he's using, and then on the other, he's got an interpreter in the room who's helping whoever's sitting in here his step to be a part of his class. It's good stuff. And there he comes up to right on the board. This is one of the rare ones that's in here that I could put a big giant star on it for TPAC. I could put a, eh, a little smaller star for Tim. But kids are in creative, they're engaged, excuse me, with using the technology. But then I give another great big star for the UDL because of the lady over there doing the signing. Remember UDL, UDL is all about multiple pathways in that everybody can participate uh, to the benefit of all, which is very different than the philosophy of the differentiated instruction by uh, Tomlinson, which I don't agree with at all. You know, the one where it says you've got 28 kids in the room, and you know that these four can't read, so you do it differently for them. This, these siblings over here can't do something, so you do differently for them. You make the whole thing accessible so that everyone can participate, as I said, is the benefit of all. We got a ring. So I got one on the watch. Okay. All right. Then what I asked you to do was to use the blend space to build one. All right. Who can I pick on? Anybody want to? Let me pull theirs up. I already looked at your size. There's nothing there. Eddie, did you put something? You didn't put anything in yet? Okay. I'm not yelling at you. All I want you to do is to go in and give this a swing. And then when you're ready, here you go. Nicely done. Okay. I agree. It's a perfect example of a TPAC lesson, right? Kids are working together. Right. So what I've asked you to do was when to take it and copy that lesson link. And then over here in our class, uh, throw it into here, I'm going to go ahead and do it for you. Okay. You do mind? No. Nope. Okay, Grace. So I'm going to put Grace T Pack Tim and UDL. Then I'm going to click on the link and I'm going to copy in that link that belongs to Gracie and I'm going to let her go. There it is. Okay. That easy. Drag it around the screen wherever you want to put it. And you do the same thing for the live text, right? You just get that link and then you throw it in there. Remember I told you about live text. Live text is stupid. Oh, by the way, it's official. How long have you all got before you're done here? How many years you got before you're finished? Mm -hmm. One, two, a huh? year and a half. Year and a half. So a live text will be gone. A year. Really? Yeah. Well, you kidding me. Are they going to make us move out? Else. Yeah. 
That's not going to be your job. That's not going to be your job. There's people down there in that office. That's their job. It's already been said to fact. Now, you'll help us move all this. Hell no. <laughs> Somebody's paying people down there more than they pay me. And they pay me well, honey. So are we going to get a refund on our restricted Well, I'm going to take the whole story. Just off the recording. Just off the recording. All right. You all know social work, school social work here on campus, Kent School Social Work. They were also a live tech school. And this one really blew me away. This if elementary teachers had a reputation as being pushovers and just, you know, sweet people who will do anything you're told because we're just that way. Um, kid school, social work people have a real reputation for that, that they just will do whatever you tell them to do. They got up on their hind quarters and they demanded, A, that they get rid of live text and that they get a refund for the, what is it now, $95? Yeah. That you had to put into it, and they got it. So I don't know if any of you all are involved in any of the, you know, student organizational things around here. But you need to bring that to somebody's attention. That that's what was done over there. I know all this because my son is now a certified whatever degree gives him the right to go out and counsel people. Um, family counselor is what he is. And he was part of the crew that got together. Who threw that in there? What is it? Thank you. Okay. Oh, I looked at her, but I was thinking of you. Okay. Y'all ready to go into Google Classroom? Yeah. All right. Let me let me give you a little background here, and I know I'm talking too much, but I want you to really have an understanding of this. So, where did the Google Classroom come from? The state of Kentucky has always been trying to come up with a answer, a standardization answer to manage content online. One of the stories that it's, it's kind of current right now. You've heard the story about the whole Brashear thing about Kentucky Wire, that it turned out maybe it was a, you know, get rich quick scheme that was put over on the uh, Bashir administration that the Bev administration now is screaming bloody murder about because they don't want you to be paying attention to the Brady thing where the guy that's given all the money to build the big aluminum plant up in, um, is it Hazard? No, it's not Hazard. That's Ashland. Ashland, Kentucky. There's another one where the guys come in and say, oh, we're going to put up a billion dollar aluminum plant over there. And all we need from the state of Kentucky is $50 million. So it took $50 million of our dollars and gave it to this guy. Do you think there's a plant up there now? No. no. But in all fairness, same thing was done with Brashear. They said, a guy was going to come in, and he said, we can wire the entire state of Kentucky from point A to point B to the door, meaning to your door, my door. You know, we'll do it all for, I forget what they call it, some billion dollars something. Now, that's a fake. But when Kentucky started wiring their schools, we were one of the first in the nation. Every school in, in the state of Kentucky is wired. I don't care where you are. You go to Bath County, you go to McCreary County, you go to Wolf County, you go to Jefferson, Fayette, you know, big, little, minuscule, anything in between, it is wired. You know, forgive me, this is uh, new. I've never had an Apple Watch before, and now I'm wearing it. It's making all kinds of noises. Um, <laughs> So when that happened, the first thing that people said was, good, now we can standardize stuff like attendance, like grades. That way, the argument went, we can keep track of kids and know who is in danger of leaving school, dropping out of school. The central office literally has now everybody's attendance records. That was all, and you'll be using these tools, by the way. That was all done through a tool called Infinite Campus. When you get a job as a teacher, one of the first things they'll teach you is how to use Infinite Campus, because that's where your attendance and your grades will go. The second piece was something called Parent Portal, which is used primarily by middle and high school folks. I don't know why they never pushed it into elementary, but it's essentially where the report card goes now. 
But it is also where if I've got a kid in, let's say, Wagner High School, and I want to know how he's doing in his physics class, I can go in and look, and the teacher is supposed to keep her or his grades in the parent portal. The train that is coming, it's coming very fast. In five years, if I'm still around, you come find me. Now, you all won't have to worry about this because none of you are going to have a high school class, right? Everybody wants to be elementary. But in five years' time, every high school teacher, I swear to you, will have a preparation, a class called online, where they'll be sitting in a room, maybe two or three kids at the most, but the vast majority of them will be out there in the great beyond, just like I am. And why is that? Number one, we've tried to keep kids from dropping out of school um, through things like Study Island, course recovery. We'd start this in middle school, and what do we find? It really doesn't make any difference. Kids still will hit like sophomore, junior year in high school and say, okay, I've had enough. I'm leaving. The argument now, of course, is I think they're finally waking up to the fact that some kids aren't just cut out for school. They need to be going to some place that teaches them a trade, which will make them better money, frankly, than a lot of the jobs that come out of school getting. Is this, is this just swan spouting off? Actually, no. The Archdiocese in Louisville already has Sundays, uh, excuse me, Saturday school and Stony school, where if you're falling behind, you are given an assignment to attend Saturday school. The teacher, your teacher of whatever it is you're learning, is then given the job of creating the online content for that Saturday school. And they get paid for it. And they get, they pay, get paid for being there for that day. So this isn't pie in the sky, sky stuff. In fact, last time I did pay tip training with the Archdiocese, which was last fall, I always ask them, just out of curiosity, how many of you, and this is everybody now, this is elementary, middle, and high, how many of you are expected to have an online presence in your school? 80% of the hands go up in a room full of about 300 new teachers. A lot of turnover in the Archdiocese. Not because it's a bad place to teach, because they don't pay anything. A lot of hands go up. And then I ask, what are you going to do? We're just supposed to have a presence. That's what the elementary folks say. The middle and high school folks say, we have to have a class that can be there for a kid who's in trouble. So the Google Classroom is the state's way of trying to find a standardization for an online presence. Now, how does this fit in with what we've been reading about um, the goo? I mean, about what Michael's been telling us, Dr. Fuller. So when he talks about this ubiquitous classroom and this ability for kids to have access to their stuff, this is what he's talking about. And what I say when I talk about Google Classroom, and I've presented on this quite a few years. Well, first I started presenting on something called Schoology, which is a little brother to Blackboard and at the time was free. And then there was another tool out there called Moodle, and I've presented and taught on Moodle as well. Moodle is another one that's free. Uh, and these are all very similar to Blackboard. The classroom, the Google Classroom, as you will see tonight, isn't anything like this. It's extremely simple. And so the question then becomes, whereas I can put you into something like this, this Blackboard environment, and I can load it up with stuff, and I can put all kinds of tests and quizzes, and I can make this a entry point, exit point of a course. You can't do that in Google Classroom. So when I talk about Google Classroom, I say, this is not the start. This is not the class. This is where you put that stuff that allow kids to see two, three, four times again. When you think of it through the lens of TPAC, the Google Classroom is really a place for you to present content to kids in multiple ways. Very universal design for learning. So that if a kid who's sitting in the room needs to hear 
what you've been trying to get into their heads, again, maybe again, they can't. So when you walk into your schools and you all get a job, the Google Classroom will already have been set up. There'll be a Google Classroom called Miss Hacks, unless she gets married, this Max Hacks Classroom. It could be your room number, it could be you know, something like that. But there's going to be a classroom set up for you. It's already going to be populated with kids. Now, depending upon the school, they may have a policy of allowing parents to see it as well, which I hope they do. Now, the Google Classroom then is a place where suddenly your kind of your teaching is now front and center. And so people are going to be looking at what you're doing in the Google Classroom and are going to be expect that to be a reflection of what's in your classroom. That's the bad side of it. We're all not, you know, pros at online design. Um, the other side of it is I had a young lady at low elementary, third grade, and she was using, well, I'm using Google Classroom. She was using a tool older than that. But she created it for her parents. It was designed strictly for parents because she was using what was called five block method for teaching reading. And her parents couldn't understand it. They would come to, you know, open classroom night or, you know, uh, parent teacher conferences and they go, what are you doing? I don't understand this reading you're doing with my kid. My kid should be using, should be using that. And everybody has their own thing on, on reading. And Five Lock does a really nice job. Created by a dear friend of mine. Really nice job. But people can't see that until someone explains it to you. And that's what she did. And she did it really, really cute. She used the uh, what little beanie, ba beanie baby. She used beanie baby, babies animals. And each animal represented a different part of the five block. And she would take them on little stories that they would tell. Um, and she would let the kids take the uh, one of the beanie babies home that represented what they were doing. And then the parent had to send back a little, what's the thing where you send around the little cardboard guy and he goes on all the trips? That's yeah. So they had to do that with the beanie baby. It was really cute, made for some really cute stuff. Um, so let's quit talking about it. Let's go dive in. Does everybody own a, a Gmail account? Everybody got a Gmail account? Okay. That's all you're going to need to do, use. Now, as I said, when you get a job, this will already be created for you. In other words, they'll already have you in here. And in Jefferson County, the way they do it is they'll give you a Gmail account. That you can't use. In other words, you can't use it to send email. But you will use it because you have to have Gmail. That's the key to the Googleverse, is to use the, the Gmail. All right. For our purposes, we're just going to create a Google Classroom using that Gmail account. And it's as simple as let me start closing some of this down. Bang. 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 And bang. So I'm going to go to classroom.google.com. That's all there is to it. Now, when I get here, all this stuff comes up, but that's because I already have stuff. You'll get here, it'll be pretty empty. Or you'll get a you'll get a login. It'll say, please log in. Use your Gmail account. When you log in, you'll end up with nothing. It should look blank. I've been teaching the 201 classes uh, classroom, so that's why there's 14 million Steve's class look googly moogly. That was with Dr. Phillips. She likes saying googly moogly, so that's why I made it that one. There's all kinds of them up here. I'll show you. You're going to see some real ones. I'll show you some real ones here in a minute. To create a Google Classroom site, all you have to do is to go over here and click on this plus sign. And then you see it says create class or join class. Now we're going to create the class and what you're going to send me is the code for your class. And then I can come join your class. But right now you're just going to create a class. It says, are you using this with students? You're going to say, yes, I am. And go ahead and continue. 
This is where we stop. Look at what you can do here. So in your school, when you get hired, guess what? That's all done. There'll be somebody in your building that will be a Google administrator. Usually it's the STC, School Technology Coordinator. It's, a, it's like a coach's job. It's an extra pay job that some poor soul takes on in the building. And so their, their job will be, well, uh, Katie is not in room 12 this year. We're going to put Katie's room 14. Some principals have this stupid idea that they need to move everybody around every year. When I, was, when I was taught that in principal school as a group, we all sat there and said, why? Why would you mess with where people have settled? Well, you want to keep everything moving. So all of this will get filled in for you. For our purposes, you just put something up here that's got your name in it. You know, uh, Grace's uh, Google Classroom, Katie's Google Classroom, Liz's Google Classroom. Just put your name in. Don't worry about filling in the other boxes. Okay, i got to come up with another one. Let's see. Let's try Swan 585. It takes it a second to create it. And then it's going to throw you. There we go. It throws you into here. Now, yours is going to look different than mine, and that's okay. Do we all land in the same place? Mm -hmm. All right. Up there where it says people, that will already be done for you. But let me show you why it's important for you to go into it. So I'm going to click on people. And as you can see, this is where you can invite people into your class. I'm going to click on this first little head down here. And if I wanted to, if you know somebody's email address, you put it in here. You ready? I'm going to give you mine. This is what you're going to do. You're going to invite me in here. Plus, you're going to put the code in as well. That way it's a, you know, we got you covered either way. So I'm S, well, you know what my email is. You're using it to log into all this stuff. SBSwan02 at Louisville.edu. Okay, so just put that in there and shoot it out to me. Give me an invite. You'll hear this term used a lot at your school. Um, if you need a three-hour course, by the way, that will only take you a week to do, as smart as you guys are, it'll take you three days. Um, I'll be offering a course over the winter session. You know what a winter session is? I don't know if they'll let you take it, though. It's 689. It's called building your own PLN. It's about as easy as it can be. But a term you'll hear a lot when you're in your school is called PLC. You heard that from an issue yet? Okay. So the PLC is that. So in other words, the first thing you'll do is um, they'll say you need to uh, invite me into your uh, Google Classroom because I'm a part of your PLC. We can share stuff back and forth. I'll show you how you do that. One of the beauties of the Google Classroom is because it's so easy to share things, having resources either come in from the district level or the resources that she creates it, she shares with you, or you, or you, it's very simple to do. That's the beauty of the Google Classroom, because it's all its own little world. So that's where you can invite teachers in. Now let me show you one more thing. Up here where the gear is, there's your class code. That's what you also will post into the live text. You'll say, Steve, my class code is blah, blah, blah. Okay? And that way I'll know what to, to put in. Although you've invited me, this is our sort of backup. Look down below that where it says stream. And it's talking about students can post and comment. Now, this is a little bit controversial. Uh, I feel very strongly that students should be able to post and comment. Now, people who teach in high school are, are really horrified. And people who are in middle school go, are you absolutely nuts? You're going to let kids post and comment? But this is something, you know, everybody knows how to do this, obviously. 
But the thing is, if you're going to develop this as a community of learners, in other words, it takes on its own life as a part of what goes on in your classroom, but continues outside the four walls of your classroom, then allowing kids to have, be able to post and comment is a very important thing to do. Now, the first time somebody posts, you're ugly, or even worse, what do you think of that? You know, anything like that, well, that's where you have to lay down those lines and say, we're not going to do this. If I were doing this with high school kids, we would have a long discussion. I guess I'd do this with elementary kids. We'd have a long discussion about something called social discourse. Social discourse is how you agree to disagree, something we desperately need to learn in this country again. We need to understand how I can disagree with what you say, but at the same time, it doesn't devolve into your mama, as I would say. This is not a your mama comment. This is, I hear what you've said, I've read what you said, but I don't think I agree with what you've written here. This is what I think. It doesn't take long for kids to get that. When I would do this with a different program, uh, third graders, fourth graders, fifth graders at Englehart Elementary School, which is right over here on, off of First Street, St. Cat. And Englehart isn't the easiest place to work in. Boy, it's sure a good place to work in. My good friend Ryan, who's over there now as the principal, wow, he's doing really cool things. The thing we try to get the kids to do over there is to understand social discourse. How do you say to somebody, I disagree with what you're talking about at the same time saying in a way that doesn't invite scorn or criticism. It's a really important tool that we have forgotten to teach people. Up there you can see, you can change the name of your class where the little pencil is. Over here you could let everybody see deleted items. I don't know why. Honestly, I don't know why. To get out of this screen is as simple as going over here to the X and clicking on it. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is about it for setting it up, except for right here. So I've come back over to the stream. And I don't know about you, but I don't really like whatever this picture is supposed to be. So I can select a theme, in other words, a theme that the Google will let me have, which, you know, are exciting, I guess. Or... I can go in here. Oh, there's patterns too. I forgot about the patterns. Yeah, well, that'd drive me nuts. I can go in here and upload my own photo. Be careful about what you upload, not because, you know, you're intelligent young women, and I know you're not going to put some up here stupid, but what you need to be aware of is how it will stretch things out. Let me give you an example. So I always show the koala bear. He's my buddy. So I put the koala bear in here and notice it has this crop feature, okay? So it's only gonna let me get in the picture, this. In one of the 201 classes, uh, in fact, it was funny because there was a guy and a girl, a man and a woman, excuse me. She put in her prom picture, he put in his prom picture. And so here they are. This is, they didn't pay attention to the crop feature. So when it comes up, it's like, right? Their faces are like this wide. They were just horrified. <laughs> and so, well, guys, I mean, if you look at it, you can you can move this around a little bit, but you see what it does? It just stretches it. It's not going to let you change this letterbox. So you've got to figure out what you're going to let be in this letterbox. And then I come down here and I select class theme, and boom, it changes it. So I get a little bit of the koala bear kind of peeking out over the top of the uh, screen here. Schools, what a lot of schools will do is they'll say, we, we already have a picture. It's the front of the building. Or it's the school mascot picture. We already have it. It's in here. You don't have to do it. But if you want to, you can make it your own. All right. Now let's get down to the work. When I click on classwork, Google has done a nice job of fixing what was a terrible system before. What they did before was they had these uh, plus signs and they really didn't make much sense as to what they were putting in here. It still doesn't in some ways. 
And I'll show you what I mean. If I go up here and click on the create, you've got an assignment, you've got a question, you've got a material, and you've got a topic, and you've got a reuse post. Reusing the post, um, I've yet to find a good example of it, except, except this is where I could go back and grab one of my guiding questions that I've created from years past, and I could reuse them, you know, the new year. It's the only thing I can come up with. Assignment is exactly what it sounds like. This is where you can put stuff in that you want kids to do. The question. The question, I think, is very, very highly underrated. I think the question is really a powerful feature in the Google Classroom. And why? It becomes that focusing question, that essential question. You know, like the gal we were watching, and she was talking about force and motion. You know, this becomes the focal point that everything then feeds off of for the rest of the, of the topic. Think of the topic as your big folder. Think of your topic as that file drawer in a file cabinet. So you really, it's kind of people kind of go, well, what do you do first, Steve? Well, this is how my brain works, and maybe your brain works differently. So don't take this as gospel. But I'm the kind of person who likes to put an organization in place first. Even though I'm a ping pong thinker, I like to have an organizational structure in place because then that frees me to get all ping pongy on what I want to do with this structure. So I would always start with topic. And my topic is going to be, and you probably can guess this, week one, unit name. You went to a date. You know, it's going to be something that's a global. It's way up here. And then I will be able then to add these other things, these assignments and these uh, questions, etc. I can keep them organized within a topic. So for right now, for just practice, why don't we go in and we're going to call a topic uh, pictograph. I'm sorry, infographic, excuse me. That's the name of the company that we created with. Let's go do infographic, and we're going to add it. Now, what I can do, and there's a real reason why I'm showing you this, is now I have a place where I can assign the kids a place to put those infographics that we made in picture chart. Okay? I can come right back up here, create the next topic, might be our TPAC, Tim, and UDL. And so now I have a place where I can put in our blend spaces that we made. You see how I'm doing this? Now let's look at the little dots on the sides of each one of the topics, just so you can see what they are. It allows you to rename it. It allows you to delete it. Be careful when it gets stuff in it. What happens when you delete it? Everything that's in it goes bye-bye. It doesn't go bye-bye, bye-bye. <laughs> because the goo, can you guess where everything is living that you have in this classroom? Yeah, we have Google Drives. It's all living in your Google Drive. That's the other thing that people don't realize. Kids have a Google Drive. How big is your Google Drive? Anybody got a Google Drive? I do. You know how big it is? Let's put it this way. I'm in fifth grade. I'm a fairly techie wise kid. And I know how to go out and get movies off of the web. All right. uh, we would refer to that as stealing. But I have enough room in my Google Drive that I could put four full-length movies in there. You know the movie I'm talking about. The one where they...